Take out your Bibles. Yeah. Hey. And we're going to start tonight. Well, you have, to, by the way, you have the outline too. Make sure you have one of the outlines. Don't be shy about taking one of those five pages stapled together. You'll need that for tonight. Let's see, what have we gone through? We've gone through number one of the, of the scriptures. Our of those faith on the scriptures. We've gone through of the true God, the Trinity. God the Son, Lord Jesus Christ. Number four, God the Holy Spirit. And number five, the devil or Satan. Talked about that, that's in our Articles of Faith. The devil made our Articles of Faith. Turn the page to Roman numeral six of mankind, that we are sinners. Different degrees, voluntarily and willing transgression become guilty as sinners. And every person goes to the same situation, not exactly the same way, but the same situation like Adam and Eve, where we're tested. God allows us to be tempted. And every one of us, like Adam and like Eve, we fail the test. And so there we choose, willingly choose, to uh, rebel against the Lord, disobey the Lord. So of mankind, number seven of the entrance into heaven. Right, let's see now, that's, no, we're going more. We did that, number eight of the existence of hell, we did that. Uh, number nine of the way to salvation. Yeah, we talked about that, of the new birth, mentioned that. Next page, of justification, and then of repentance and faith. So we're going to pick up tonight with Roman numeral 13 of the security of the believer. And honestly, this separates us from other churches that do not believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. So let's start this evening in John chapter 10, Gospel of John chapter 10. Also, I'm always getting, I'm always thinking about, of course, the lessons and the subject. And one of the questions I thought of, and this is not in your notes, you might want to add this to your notes. If you're wrong on doctrine, is it really that bad? Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, when you're in school, you take tests. You know, how many times did you get 100 on all your tests? Probably never on all of them. Got some things wrong. Is all that bad? Is it really that wrong or that bad to... Uh, or is it really that bad to be wrong on, on doctrine? It's just an understanding. So you misunderstand it, so what? Well, think about it. Why is it so bad? I came up with five, maybe six different thoughts here. First of all, being wrong on this is a heart problem. It's not just an intellectual mis uh, unbelief. It's a heart problem. Your heart, when a person is wrong on these things, it's because it's, its heart is wrong. It's more than just an intellectual thing. So it's a heart problem. God talks about that. Thou shalt love the Lord the God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. So it's not just an intellectual problem, but it's a heart problem. Good. And that makes it a lot more serious. Good. Number two I had, when, you, when you're wrong in this, you're actively choosing against God's truth. Right. You're going against what God said. You're using your will against what God said. That's pretty serious. When God gives a command, we're to obey it. We're to believe it. But it's actually choosing against God's truth. What God says is true. We're saying, I'm not going to believe that. Wow. Good. Yeah. Number three. Why is this so bad? Being wrong is so bad? Because you could have known that people... I'll put this at you. Because people could have known the truth. They didn't want to. Mm -hmm. The will was involved. Mm -hmm. They didn't want... They could have known the truth. There's nobody who ever lived, is alive today, or will be alive yet, that could not have known the truth. Everyone can. Amen. That's why everyone's guilty. Because everyone can know the truth, but they choose not to. And that makes it serious. I have number four in my little outline here. Is it is being wrong that bad? Plain old laziness. <laughs> We're just lazy. Is lazy that bad a thing? Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. When you're lazy about things, you're going to miss out on a lot of things. You're going to be wrong. I Number four, I got a, got a little question mark there, but I think laziness also is what makes it bad. We, don't, we shouldn't be lazy. You know, God is a God of life. 
Yep. He gives life. He gives excitement in people's lives. He gives a purpose for living. Amen. Yep. So they could have known true. They're lazy about it. Oh yeah, here's number five in my little outline that I wrote down here. Not to search to find out truth. You're saying God's truth is not that important. Does that say something or what? Not taking the time and the energy and the ability we have to search out the truth. You're saying that's not that important. God's truth is not that important. So what are they saying when they say God's truth is not that important? They're saying God's not that important. That is a huge mistake, isn't yeah. it? Huge mistake. Oh yeah, when you're saying that God's not important, but you're, what you're doing then is saying other things are more important than God, too. Wow. Other things are more important than God. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Can you understand now why this is serious? Why doctrine's important? Yeah. And also, when you believe the wrong things, you're going to end up in the wrong place. Right. That's pretty important, too, isn't it? All right, let's see. Where did I say John chapter 10, verse 27? We're on the subject now, number 13. <clears throat> Gospel of John, verse 27. Okay, this is I'm talking about the security of the believers. And, okay, it says here, My sheep, this is the Lord's words here himself, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. That makes me feel very, very good yeah. that God knows me. You could say the same thing if you're a Christian tonight too. God, the Lord knows you personally. And they follow me. Amen. There's evidence of a real Christian. And I give them eternal life. Now, the next part, and they shall never perish. So let me repeat that verse 28 again. And I give unto them, the Lord is Something the Lord gives here, he says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Now, the big question here then is, when do you get eternal life? When? When you die? Nope. Well, I think <laughs> eternal life, when you die, that, that just doesn't make sense because your, your uh, destiny is already determined for you. It has to take place before. It takes place, well, biblically. You know the answer to this. When you believe, when you sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. then you have, H-A-B, have present tense, eternal life, when you believe on Him. You don't wait to, to you die to see if you got, get the, get have it or not. You get it. You get eternal life when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in this world, in this time. Amen. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never, never perish. So once they have eternal life, they're never going to perish. It doesn't matter what happens after that. It doesn't matter if they do go the wrong way. Although, once you're Christian, you're born again. There's such a change, such a difference. There's that new birth of God's nature. The Holy Spirit of God births you. And what a difference. And I don't think you want to go away from the Lord Amen. if you're saved. Amen. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You have to be stronger than Jesus Christ. Somebody stronger than Jesus Christ would have to take you out of the Lord's hands. Who is stronger than Jesus Christ? Who is stronger than Jesus Christ? Who is Almighty God Himself, too? Nobody is. Who's, who's the one that might give it a try and would be stronger than any person? And that's the devil, huh? The devil. But is the devil stronger than Jesus Christ? No. See the smile on my face? I like that. I like that. The devil's not stronger than Jesus Christ. Nobody's stronger than Jesus Christ. And if he's in your hands, he says, I'll take care of you. Nobody's going to take you out of my hand. That gives great assurance. Amen. Great confidence. Amen. Any man pluck them out of my hand. Then verse 29. My father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Amen. There's a double challenge. And then verse 30. I and my father are one. Amen. That's security. Once you're saved, you're born again. The Lord has a hold of us, and nobody is stronger than He is. Now, when does again? When does salvation begin? When you're born again. Yep. Let me read under that paragraph, paragraph, paragraph a little bit. We believe that all born again persons are eternally secure in Christ, because the Scriptures teach that our justification—justification justification being how we got saved, justified. 
before God rest upon the finished work of Christ and not some good work of the individual. I've heard this for many years, probably when I was still in Bible college. I heard it and I liked it. Uh, if you're saved and you're kept by the power of God, you're saved and you're kept by the power of God. It's a matter of where you don't, you don't work to get saved and you don't work to stay saved. Now some people say that, well they say, well yeah, it's all by grace that you're, you get saved, but then after that, you have to keep yourself saved. You can't sin anymore. Or if you do that, you, you lost your salvation again. Well, who keeps us saved? That's the question. We, uh, everybody believes that Jesus is the Savior. He gets people saved. But after you say, who keeps you saved? Not who got you saved, but who keeps you saved after you're saved. Jesus Christ also keeps us saved. Amen. For, for it... And it forever remains the unchanging grounds of the believer's faith. This security is further guaranteed by the continuous high priestly work of Jesus Christ now in heaven. And by the biblical doctrine of eternal security, or once saved, always saved. When correctly understood, is scriptural and the cause of great hope and peace to the true Christian believer. And again, like we also say many times, some people say, well, then I'll get saved and then go out and sin all I want. And I'll still be saved. Well, if that's your attitude, you never got saved to begin with. Right, right. That's not the attitude of someone who's getting saved. Amen. All right, number 14, separation. The most disliked doctrine of all. Come on. Great. People don't want to live separated. They don't want to be separated from the world and its ways. They don't want to be separated from the world's music. They don't want to be separated from the uh, world's dress styles and clothing and how to dress. They don't want to be separated from the world's money and the way they make money. They don't want to be separated from that. They don't want to be separated from the world's sports and all the professional sports things. They don't want to be separated from all that. They People don't like separation. Even a lot of people claiming to be Christians don't like separation. Right. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Good. And honestly, the, I think Roy Thompson said this years ago. He says when a church starts going down, the first area they go down in is in separation and standards. That's where the church starts to go down. And it is hard. It's hard to keep up standards in a church and separation. You know, we have, we shouldn't, you know, honestly, in a church, we shouldn't even need rules. We shouldn't even need to have them written out. Christians should just know what to do and how to uh, live and everything. And we shouldn't even need that. We have standards for choir. We give people a standard. you got to dress this way and act this way and look this way and don't do this and don't do that and do this and do that. Uh, when you're in the choir, you know, you're in the Sundays. Uh, during the week, you need to have a good testimony, too, during the week also. It's not just a Sunday thing. Right. Yeah. And a lot of bigger churches that don't have a close knowledge of the people there, they have to have them written out, all these standards. And then people have to sign, they have people sign those standards. Like, I'll not go out and get drunk all week long, and I'll not smoke cigarettes, and I'll not listen to wrong. You know, all these different things. And they have to they get people to sign these things. And I've always thought, why do they even need to do that? I mean, if you're going to serve the Lord, you should know these things. Amen. And you shouldn't be doing them without having to sign some kind of paper that you're not doing these things. But, well, 1 Corinthians chapter, that's their problem. We're not a big church, so I don't have that problem here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning verse 14. Yeah, okay. And God had, and God had both raised up, let's see, raised up the Lord, and God had both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his own power, knowing not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What knowing not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? Or for two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What, knowing not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, uh, which is in you and which ye have of God, and you're not your own. 
For you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, your physical body, and in your spirit, which are which are God's. Second Corinthians, also chapter six. Second Corinthians. Separation, separation, separation. Boy, it's so hard, it's so hard. For even well, professing Christians, separation. This is this is the area. Oh, this is the area when it's so, so difficult. People get their feelings hurt. They get, feel bad. Well, we shouldn't have that kind of, those kind of rules. Uh, we're not, that's legalism. Hmm. Come on. No, that's separation. Right, amen. It's yeah. not legalism. That separation, that's sanctification. Right. Second Corinthians chapter 6, beginning of verse 14. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath the righteousness with unrighteousness? Right. Well, there shouldn't be any fellowship that right. way. And what communion hath light with darkness? There shouldn't be any. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? None. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with the idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God. They shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate. Yep. There's our word separate, separation. Say the Lord and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You want to be close to the Lord where he receives you? Be separate. Right. Now, every Bible truth, every Bible doctrine has extreme degrees on both sides. Some have reached a place where they think everybody shall dress like the Amish. I think that's an extreme goal the other way. You know, too, too much in that way becomes, becomes legalistic too. But and be separate though, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will receive you. Verse 18, and will be a father unto you. Say, God becomes our father. Now, I had a good dad. He passed away, it's been a number of years ago. But he was a good dad, faithful, hardworking, all those good things. But God is my father, too. Amen. What a wonderful father he is. I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Amen. The Lord Almighty. Separate. Be separate. Be separate in, in the way you live. Be different in the way you live. Be, be holy, righteous in the way you live. Be different from the world. Don't be ashamed of being different from the world. Amen. That's a problem we have. We're embarrassed. If we're... We live differently than the world. We get embarrassed if we dress better than the world. You ought to dress better than the world. Right. That's the world. That's the way they dress. So don't use the Hollywood people as a standard for how you should dress. Right. Very good. Use uh, Pastor Andy Rusnackle for the way she dress. Use Mrs. Carol Rusnackle as the way she dress. So be careful these things. Separate, don't be ashamed. Don't be shy about these things. This is the first area where a church will start to go down in the area of separation. So understand, realize that. Please believe that tonight. Don't, don't make my job any harder than it is. <laughs> you know, uh, don't, don't cause me to church, toss and turn at night because oh, people aren't, you know, the standards are going down and things aren't just as good as they should be or need to be or used to be. Oh, please don't let that happen. Standards, standards, standards. Amen. Let, let the world be embarrassed about us rather than the Lord being embarrassed about us. Amen. Okay. So standards, standards. Separation, be separate. Mm -hmm. uh, see, we believe in Bible separation as we set apart from the world, sin, self, and Satan, and we separate unto the praise of His glory, that He will glory in us and for the furtherance of the gospel. Worldly lifestyles and practices should be avoided and condemned both by our teaching and personal example. All saved individuals should be separated both outwardly and inwardly, being holy in mind, even our thoughts, even our thoughts, and in body. We believe, however, that sanctification does not come by the outward keeping of laws and commandments, and not just by rules keeping, but by the inner change that happens when that person is born again. Amen. Is born again. So it's an evidence of real salvation when there's a change there in the area of separation. Separation. 
All right, number, number 15 of the church. We believe that a New Testament church is a local, local congregation of baptized believers founded by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, associated by biblical doctrine and fellowship, under the direction of the Lord through his word and his spirit, observing the two ordinances of Christ, baptism and the Lord's Supper, governed by his laws, called out to congregate for worship and service, not watching television. Amen. That's yeah. not Amen. there, but that's, that's what we're getting at here. Not just watching church on TV. Right. Now, we had somebody send a real nice letter this last week, and they were watching us, I guess, listening to the, oh, listening to the radio, yeah. And that was nice, but you got to go to church, too. Amen. Go to church. That's a help. I know radio program, all those things. If I didn't believe in them, we wouldn't have them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a help, definitely a big help. But people need to go to church. Amen. Hey, amen. Praise amen. To fulfill the great evangelist commission of Matthew 28, 19, and 20, and to build up the saints to Christian maturity, to do the work of the ministry. Each local church is a body of Christ and is to be under the Lord's direct authority. Every church is under the direct authority of Jesus Christ himself. Following the biblical leadership and authority of the under shepherd, the pastor. And by the way, I, if I was to make some changes in the, uh oh, hang on, of the, I would cross out the word under shepherd. Pastors are not under shepherds, they're shepherds. Right. They're not under shepherds, they're shepherds. Christ is the great shepherd though. Yeah. So uh, over the years, that's one thing I, I've heard pastors talk about that, one in particular, and boy, that made sense. We're not under shepherds, we're shepherds. Amen. We have a shepherd, a flock, a church. But Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd, right. the great shepherd. Right. Amen. Well, under shepherd, that uh, not quite script, well, that's the word, not real exact, but they put it that way. But it was the under shepherd, the pastor, who is the bishop and elder. Bishop and Yeah, bishop, bishop here. Yeah. Uh, brother. Robert Denton walks in here on Sunday morning sometimes and goes, Good morning, Bishop. Amen. And then next Sunday he'll walk in and he'll say, Good morning, Elder. Yep. And then the next uh, Sunday he'll walk in and say, Good morning, Pastor. Amen. So he's got a nail. He knows what he's talking about there. Bishop and Elder. We reject the plurality of elders teaching where there's a different kind of elders in church. There's the teaching elders and there's the ruling elders. No, we don't believe that. We don't believe that scripture. I can give you some information if you're interested too. Then it says, each church is to be autonomous, right. all by itself, handling its own affairs, Amen. and free from any higher yeah. ecclesiastical, isn't that a great word, ecclesiastical, right. or political and yeah. governmental authority. Right. Every church handles its own affairs. Its members should show Christian charity, be nice to each other and fellowship towards each other in all matters personal. <laughs> we had the word business here. I thought that's interesting. When you're dealing in business, with, even with other Christians, business or church related, or church related. So the church, the churches are important. Amen. Every church is a church. <laughs> right? Yeah. Every church is a church unto itself. Yep. This is our church here. This is a church body. This is a family. This is a church. Bible Baptist Temple is a church. Cleveland Baptist Temple, uh, Church, Cleveland Baptist Church is a, another church. And there's hundreds and thousands of them, thousands and thousands throughout the world. But every church is a church handling its own affairs. There's no power over us. Uh, many times, not many times, but I'm here so often, somebody say, well, Pastor, what happens when we get old enough and you can't be a pastor anymore? Uh, who do we go to? How do we find the next pastor for our church? And with some churches, they do have a central headquarters you go to. We don't have anything like that. Amen. Then where do you find the next pastor? Well, first of all, should that ever happen? And I'm not saying it's going to. I'm just saying, should that ever happen? Pray like you've never prayed before. Amen. It's so important to have the right man pastor in the church. Amen. Pray about that. And then there are, things will open up. There's other churches that believe the same way we do about these matters, exactly. And they have maybe an associate pastor there that's ready to become a pastor. 
And so people pray about that, fast and pray about those things. Yeah. And then you'll call that person to be the next pastor here at Bible Baptist Temple. But there's ways of doing it without having some kind of central authority uh, organization over our church. Good. There's nobody over our church. We are it. Amen. We are it right here. You are it. I am it right here. We make our own decisions. That's one of the reasons we have business meetings once a year. Uh, to, to kind of talk over things. And so everybody's aware of what's going on and how we're doing as a church too. So I think it's up to the church, a local church. Uh, radio program's good. Even television programs are on um, YouTube and things like that, that's good, that's helpful. But nothing beats coming out to a certain place where other people are here too, and we sing the songs, we worship the Lord in music, we listen to the teaching, the preaching of the Word of God, we get together, we fellowship. This is what's the way the Lord set it up. Amen. And I think He set it up right. Yeah. If it was to be different, it would have made it different. Right. All right, next page. Baptism. Turn the page over, page four or five. <clears throat> yeah, we have a few more minutes. are good. Thank you for your prayers for me, especially for my voice to be clear. That is the only problem. Baptism. Now, we haven't had bat baptism here for a while. There are about three people ready to be baptized. I want to be baptized here. I feel a little bad because I put them off, but there are three ready to be baptized. But let's talk about this a little bit <coughs> of baptism. We believe that Christian baptism is one of the two ordinances of the local church and is to be done after salvation. Amen. All right. There are times I, I put people off. I, yep. I don't want good to just good. baptize somebody. Yeah, good. I, I, I want to, if they say, well, Pastor, I want to be baptized. Will you baptize me? What I say in mysterious, closed, uh, I'm looking for a certain word here, uh, kind way, I say no. <laughs> now, I say it diplomatically. I say it kindly. I say it because until, until I get to know the person, I want to find out they their Christianity is real or not. Amen. A lot of people have picked up the idea that of the Catholics and the Protestant churches that gotta get baptized, you know, to go to heaven. Well, they need to realize, no, you don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. You, can, you need to be saved to go to heaven. You need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be born again to go to heaven. But you can go to heaven without being baptized. I've told people that I can tell by their reaction, it just goes right over them. So, so they'll ask me, well, then, will you baptize me? They're not getting it. I said, well, a person has to be born again first and, and give evidence that they really are a born again Christian, that they, they're serving the Lord, that there's been that change in their life. Amen. Their evidence, obvious, uh, um, physic, not physical, uh, outward appearance, that they are saved and born again. You can see the evidence there. And if I'm unsure myself, what I do is I... I don't know if this is a biblical technique or not. I stall. Good, good, good. I want to give more time. I want, I want to watch the person see if they really are saved or not. I don't want to be guilty of giving anybody false assurance. Good, hey, good, good pastor. That, to me, that's so important. Yes. I, I've seen churches that they just baptize anybody and everybody. That's right. And after it shows that 90% or more of their baptized, baptized people didn't even come back to church. Wow. Right. You know, like the elder self to Christian. You know, you put the <laughs> tablet in the water and just fizzle away. Once they hit the water, they just fizzle away. So baptism. We believe in Christian baptism, one of two ordinances, okay? But is after salvation by complete immersion in water of the believer, not sprinkling. Yeah, there's that word. If, it, if the Bible taught sprinkling, there is a word for that. It's called ran, Greek word for that, it's called rantized, mm -hmm. R-H-A-N-T-I-Z-E-D, uh, not baptized, rantized means sprinkling, baptized means by complete immersion, and by the way, the word baptized was never translated, it was what they called transliterated, they didn't translate the word baptized, they just used the, word, the Greek word in the English Bibles, they never translated it. So that's why we have the word baptized. We don't have the word immersed there. To be immersed in water completely. Uh, why exactly? I don't know. That's what God directed. I know that. I know it's not the wrong part of our Bibles. I know that. 
I know it should be in our Bibles. I know that. Bapti the word baptized. So the word baptized. And if it meant sprinkling, there is a Greek word for that. Like I said, rantize. Then it would be the word rantize, not baptized. But baptized means complete immersion. In water of the believer, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, by the authority of the local church, to show forth in a solemn, solemn, and beautiful picture of faith in the crucified, buried, under the water, risen Savior, brought up out of the water. See, everyone's baptism pictures Christ yeah. being died for our sins, buried, and resurrected. With its effects showing our own death to sin and resurrection to new life in Christ, it has no part in the person's salvation, but is the answer of a good conscience toward God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Now some of these things are, you've heard before, some, some you've heard several times, and for some maybe it is uh, the first time you've heard this. First Peter, baptism also makes a person a member of that local church. There's another reason why I'm careful about who I baptize. Because through baptism, when they're baptized, they become a member of a church. And then, of course, we reject infant baptism. And, notice the next part, and all churches that practice it. We reject infant baptism. We reject churches that do infant baptism. All churches that practice it as being unbiblical right. and spiritually misleading. Right. Spiritually misleading, giving people false assurance, false confidence. Mm -hmm. All right, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. The Apostle Peter, of course, talking here about baptism. He says, the like figure. So first of all, it says it's a like figure. And again, that's the word like a picture. It's not the real thing. It's a picture. The old illustration, if I was to show you my driver's license, if I was to take my driver's license out of my wallet and show you my... Uh, the, the driver's license, that I'd say, who is this? And you'd say, well, it's pastor. And I'd say, no, it's not pastor. Mm -hmm. It's a picture of a pastor. Right. It's a picture of me. It's not me. Now, you've heard that before, I'm sure. Yeah. But it's a good illustration of it. Here's the reality. That's just a picture. Mm -hmm. Baptism is just a picture. It's not the reality. Mm -hmm. The light figure where to even baptism as a picture, doth also now save us, not to put away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. So before you to baptize, you have to have a good conscience toward God. And nobody has a good conscience toward God until they're born again. Amen. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, now who's gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers be made subject unto him. Yes, yes, yes. That's a wonderful thought. And, okay, so baptism. Anything else I want to say here? Okay. What did Bruce Bussman used to say? The power is in the blood. The power is not in the tub. <laughs> we reject infant baptism in all churches that practice it. So important. Be careful of that. Be careful that the Calvinists, they baptize babies. When I was first saved down there in Key West, I on the missions to the military. And Brother Jim Eggerman was the one that headed it up. And once in a while on Sunday, you'd take about four or five of us young guys, new Christians, and they traveled to different parts of Florida, uh, visiting different churches that helped support the missions there. Well, there were one time I went with them. There's one church, there were four or five of us young guys, they're military guys, and we went to a Presbyterian church. Now, Presbyterian, they they baptize babies. Yeah. Calvinist churches baptize babies. Uh, and they asked for some testimonies, and I think I really embarrassed everybody. Oh, what the, I forget how I said it. it was something about, yeah, now, now that I'm saved, I got baptized, and it didn't mean anything when I was baptized as a baby in that Lutheran church. Oh, it was quiet in that church. <laughs> now, I didn't, honestly, I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't understand the whole issue. I understand the Presbyterians, they baptize babies, or at least some of them do. I don't know specifically if all of them do or not, but I remember, I'm still kind of embarrassed about that, but it was said. That was not my mistake. That was their mistake for taking me there. That's, that was their problem. Uh, 
but young Christians, you know, they'll say things without thinking about it. Sometimes, right. sometimes it's a good thing to say, too. All right, all right, so we got the year. We'll stop for tonight. We're up through 16 next week. We'll talk about the Lord's Supper. We haven't had the Lord's Supper for a little bit. I'll talk, talk about why we haven't recently. But even when we did, we only had about twice a year. I know Key West Baptist Temple down there, and I started going that your day. They had the Lord's Supper every, every Sunday. Wow. Every Sunday they had it there. And then I went to another church. They had it maybe once every three or four years. It was about all. So we'll talk about that next Sunday, too, Lord's Supper. Sometimes, a lot of times, the people that really want the Lord's Supper, it can show a misunderstanding on their part. You need to understand what it is, what it means, right. and not uh, misunderstand it. Because yeah. like baptism, the Lord's Supper has nothing to do with a person's salvation. Right. And really, a person needs to be right with God. Now, it's a reminder, well, we'll get into next week, but it's a reminder what the Lord has done for us. It's to impress upon our hearts how important that was, what he did. This to be a memorial, to remember, a memorial to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us, and to make it more special, more special every each and every time we have the Lord's Supper. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this good evening. Yeah. Lord, each and every one that's out, I pray they've learned some things, and I pray they've been encouraged, motivated, even revived, Lord. We need that. And Lord, help us, give us understanding just how we're to handle things in a, a strange situation. And our country is really worldwide, too. Yep. Give us your direction, understanding how we're to do what we should be doing here. But Lord, I know this is your church. We need to be meeting. I know that for sure. Amen. So just continue to bless. Continue to help us not to get sidetracked from what the main purpose for us being here is. And to get out the gospel. Amen. And tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For it is in Jesus' name we pray and ask it tonight.